and they'd start looking around and they could smell the chocolate. Eventually they would find the chocolate and all the while the scientists are studying what's going on in their brain. So here's what they found. Once the rat had developed, that, uh, had begun, there was all sorts of brain activity going on. The charts, the graphs were just jammed with lots of very high energy reports. Once the habit had been formed, the habit of where to find the chocolate, because the chocolate was always in the same place, what they began to notice was a big spike of mental activity as soon as that noise went off that would signal that the door was about to open. Then, as the rats were looking, were following their known path to the chocolate, the brain activity was very quiet. Then when they found the chocolate, another big spike. That other big spike is, yeah, I found the chocolate. <laughs> they kept doing the experiment kept studying the rats, and after a while, here's what happened, this is the fascinating part. After a while, that big spike, the brain did a copy and paste on that big spike that signaled, I've got the reward. It started showing up right after the big spike that would happen at the sound that indicated the door was about to open and I was about to be able to go through my routine to get my chocolate. So let's explain what, what that means. The habit is not just that thing you do. The habit has three parts. The cue, which for the rats in this case, was the sound that went off just as the door was opening. The routine, which was that quiet period in the brain, and the reward. So those are the three parts, a cue, a routine, and a reward. So it's that routine with the very low level of brain energy going that tells us why we have habits in the first place. <clears throat> they save the brain energy. Brain takes up, don't quote me the numbers here, but in proportion, the brain takes up about 6% of your body mass and uses somewhere around 20% of your energy. So the brain really uses up a lot of your energy store. And over millions of years and so on of evolution, the brain has become very, very good at finding ways to conserve energy so that it can do other things with the limited and finite source of energy that's available to it. So habits are good because they conserve energy. Now, here's the other thing. I told you about that copy and paste where the brain pattern that was associated with the reward got pasted in so that it immediately follows the cue. That's what we normal non-scientists call craving. So it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you're in the habit of leaving your desk, walking down the hall and getting a cup of coffee, a donut, finding somebody to chat with for a couple of minutes. Pretty soon 3 o'clock shows up and you get this agitated feeling. That's the craving. <coughs> starting to work on it. That's the craving starting to work on it. Now, the big question, right? How do you change a habit? What do you do to change a habit? Habits are fragile in the sense that they can be changed. But you can never, ever get rid of a habit. Picture this. It's 7.30 in the morning, time to leave for work. You walk into the kitchen, you turn right, and you reach for your keys because that's where the key book is 
is located. It's May 1st. You move to a new place. In this new kitchen, the key hook has to be on the left. Imagine how many days at 7.30 in the morning you walk into the new kitchen and you turn to the right and you're reaching for a hot pan or a saucepan and not your keys because your keys, in fact, are over here. The shadow of that habit still persists. Eventually, you change the routine and you train yourself to turn to the left to get your key. But the habit persists. Which is a problem if you have a habit that you really, really want to change. So how do you do it? The key to changing habit is in identifying the cue and the reward. What is it that triggers the habit and what is it that is your actual reward? Because if you can come to understand what those are, you can understand what's going on in your habit and can substitute the routine knowing what it is that triggers the routine and the reward that you're going to get. So I mentioned earlier the possibility that at 3 in the afternoon you leave your desk to go get a jelly donut or a cup of coffee or a Coke or whatever it is. You don't want to be eating a jelly donut or coffee or getting a Coke. So what do you do? Do I to identify what it is that you're actually seeking out in that routine? What is the real reward? Is it the sugar from the jelly donut? Is that it? Or is it simply the exercise of walking around away from your desk? Is it the distraction? Is it the opportunity to visit <clears throat> Bill, whose cubicle is 150 yards down the way, and you never ever see Bill except at 3.02 when you walk by? I want to get rid of the jelly donuts, but I do want to visit with Bill. I get up and I walk around and maybe I have an apple, but I also visit with Bill. So I satisfy the reward, but I change the routine in the middle. That's your trigger, or rather that's the technique. Keep the cue, keep the reward, knowing what they are, and then change the routine. Now, changing habits isn't easy. Ask anybody who has tried to change the way they eat. Huh. Or to give up smoking. Huh. What would you say is the one thing that you absolutely <clears throat> have to have in order to change a habit? Willpower. Thank you. If I had candy here to share, I would throw it. <laughs> Here's the thing about <clears throat> willpower. It used to be believed that willpower was a skill that you developed with maturity. It used to be believed that willpower was a little bit like a computer program. Teach your brain the right things to do, it will do that. I know, I didn't believe it either. But that's what psychologists used to believe. So now, imagine this, you have an experiment. One type of psychological experiment involves rats and maize and chocolate. The other kind of psychological experiments almost always involve college students. Because they're a ready source of victims for experimentation by people who teach psychology and do research programs. So you bring a bunch of students into your lab area, having told them they have to be they have to have not eaten for some number of hours before the experiment begins. You tell them that it's going to take a few minutes before we can start. Why don't you sit here and wait? We'll come get you in five or ten minutes when, when we're ready for you. You're seated at, the, the student is seated at, uh, in a little small room, and on a table is a bowl of cookies, freshly baked chocolate chips. And next to that is a bowl of freshly washed radishes. 
<laughs> Some students are told that in order for the experiment to be a success, we need you to be in the radish state. So we want you to eat as many radishes as you like. But don't eat a chocolate chip. So then, some time passes. Some students, even when they're told just to eat radishes, they eat a couple of cookies. Right? Some people don't eat any of the cookies. And maybe they have a radish or two. The experiment, they get into what they think is the experiment, and they're supposed to do some math puzzles that are impossible. And they're told to simply work on them until they're done. Students who ate only radishes gave up. <laughs> Students who ate cookies worked until the psychologists came to get them. They tended to put in as much as 60% more effort having not consumed, had, or having not had to expend willpower to pass on the cookies. So it turns out that willpower is sort of like a resource that you can expend, that you can deplete. And here's the kicker. The fuel for willpower, glucose, sugar. So the cookies, not only, if, if somebody ate the cookies, not only did they not expend any willpower, they fueled their existing store of willpower. So we, we replenish our willpower every day with sleep, with our diet, with exercise. But there's a double whammy. Where am I here on the double? Oh, double, double whammy, we won't get to it just yet. So, the fuel is glucose. Now, who here uses a to-do list? Quite a few of us, right? Is absolutely everything you need to do on that list? Or do things keep coming to mind that, oh yeah, I told myself I was going to have a million dollars in the bank by the time I'm 40. <laughs> and I'm 39 years old and my birthday's next week. <laughs> I keep meaning to mow the back lawn, right? Whatever. Those to-dos and those unmet goals, they just, they're going to keep coming to mind. That's the Zygarnik effect, named after a psychologist who first noticed it. But what happens is unmet goals and uncompleted tasks that you have committed to do will keep coming to mind until they're done. Two interesting things. What happens when that occurs is that it reduces your focus for getting everything else done. It lowers your level of self-image. Because after all, you're being constantly reminded that all oh, all these things I haven't done, and it sucks up. Guess what? Glucose. But there's a way to trick the Zygarnik effect. Make a list, and more importantly, make a plan. Psychological experiment. I won't go into details. But the proof is in the pudding. If you put things on a list in a plan, if you tell your brain, listen, I'm going to take care of this between 10 and 11 a.m. on Tuesday, it won't keep coming back to mind. Because your brain knows you're going to do it. Now, if you keep putting it off, you won't get that effect. But if, in fact, you start doing things according to plan, you will conquer that Zygarnik effect. Fascinating stuff. A plan so often is the key. So, 
Next. A little characteristic here with willpower. Being aware of yourself seems to have the capacity to keep you working to meet your own inner standards. Experiment. People are charged with completing X number of tasks. Put a mirror on the desk that people are using to work on those tasks. Some 50 or 60 percent of the people, or rather people with a mirror, so that they can see themselves working, get 50 or 60 percent more work done than those without a mirror. Even though the mirror is small, and doesn't really have any particularly direct connection to what you're doing. Just having the mirror there, it's like you're looking at yourself doing the work and you're evaluating how you're doing it. Say, I've got these standards, I know I want to get this work done. There's this little mirror. And it's working the brain to force you to work up to your own standards. So self-awareness will help you. Keep going there. All right, so I said earlier that willpower has a double whammy. Here it is. Willpower increases, or rather, when you deplete willpower. And what kinds of things deplete willpower? Right, loss of glucose, making too many decisions, having to use your willpower will deplete it. Unfortunately, the consequence of depleted willpower and depleted glucose is an increase in your emotions and the feeling of cravings. So now think back to what we learned about habits and what makes habits so sturdy is the craving. If we allow our willpower to be depleted, it makes it that much harder to combat the cravings because the cravings seem to be stronger when our willpower and our glucose is depleted. <clears throat> All right. So what can you do? What are some other things you can do to <coughs> get at Here, I won't ask for a show of hands, but who here has either tried or know somebody who has tried Weight Watchers? Right? A very, very successful organization. And in some ways, they are successful despite themselves because they put together programs long before research proved that these things would really work. Two factors about Weight Watchers that make it successful the first is the monitoring. Right? You're keeping a food diary in some form. Again, research. People eating <clears throat> a diet or people working to change their spending and saving habits. Those who follow the suggestion of simply keeping a diary, just record what you eat, just record what you spend. After six months, the monitoring people, the diary people, 50-60% better at weight loss, better at changing their spending and saving habits. Just the act of monitoring. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Because that diary is just like the mirror on your desk. It's making you aware of what's going on, aware of your behavior. So the simple act of monitoring can make it immense difference. The second thing that Weight Watchers does is it creates a community. People will commit more when they are part of a community of change. We see that in Toastmasters, right? How many people do you know who have ever improved their own tendencies working alone in their spare room? Get feedback every couple of weeks, and it becomes
becomes a lot easier to be part of the group. All right. There are a few other things that I would like to enter, to, to, to sprinkle in here. But I'd like to turn, your, turn to the other side of your handout and run quickly through 10 things that you can do to change habits, lose both our empathy, reviewing some of the things that we've talked about, and like I said, I may sprinkle a couple of new things in. So, first thing, know your limits. Make decisions when you're well fed. Who here has driven on a road trip with a little child in the car? <laughs> Is it easier to deal with that little child at the end of a very long day when you've been in the car for seven hours straight? Or imagine after about four or five hours, you all take a break. You stop at the McDonald's or you stop somewhere, you get a little bit of soda, a little nibble of some kind, and then you go back on the road for the last hour or two, and man, when you get to your destination, no matter how messed up things might be, isn't it so much easier to deal with trouble when you're well fed, when you've taken a break, you've boosted your glucose a little bit. Know your limits. Best decision making is not right before supper. Best decision making is going to be when you're well fed. Look for symptoms of depletion. Depletion is going to lead to crankiness, high levels of emotion, remember? Depletion of glucose is going to make our emotions feel stronger. So pay attention to those kinds of things and gauge your emotions against your eating pattern for the day. Pick the battles. I really ought not to be eating ice cream on a regular basis. So I try to keep the hot and dash out of the freezer. If there is no hot and dash, I'm not very likely to eat any. So we save our energy for more important battles. And we set ourselves up for success by limiting the potential for challenges to deplete our stores of energy and glucose. All right, make a to-do list. There are two things I want to highlight here. I want to keep that psychotic effect at bed, but also, things do go wrong, don't they? Is there anybody here who has ever worked for Starbucks? Yes. Uh, you get trained in how to deal with customers. You're trained to be enthusiastic and all those things, right? And you're also trained in what to do when things go wrong. I'm sorry, you guys have a startup or Starbucks. Oh, I'm sorry, I said Starbucks. Oh, okay, all right. So no, Starbucks, <laughs> at Starbucks, if you get a long line of coffee-deprived customers, <laughs> You can imagine the challenge of staying ebullient and friendly. And, oh, how are you this morning, sir? I want my coffee! <laughs> Starbucks trains its employees in planning for times when that will happen because it will. And not only do they say, here's what you do, right, follow these steps, they have their employees write it down. Make a plan for how you will apply our method in a way that suits your personality, write it down, make a plan. Those are called inflection points. You can expect them to happen. You hear you read stories of people who have given up drinking, and they're sober for three years, four years, five years, and then all of a sudden, bang, Uncle Joe dies. And the next thing you know, it's a problem. But if you make a plan, and you say, when something really, really bad happens, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these steps. In most cases, that's what people do. They take those steps, and they get past the challenge. So if you have anticipated challenges mm. in, in some habit you're trying to fix, make a plan. Make it in advance. Put it in the writing. All right. Beware the plan.
planning fallacy. Who here has ever done a home repair or renovation project? So I'm, now, of those of you who have done one, how many of you finished the project in less than 50% of the time that you thought it would take? <laughs> how many of you took three times as long as you thought it was going to take? Four times, five times, six times? Right. That's the planning fallacy. Stuff always takes longer than you think it will. Plan for that. All right. Should we get back to the basics? Don't forget your basics. Eat, sleep, rest, and exercise. They're the source of habit-changing power, the source of good decision-making power, is glucose. Keep filling your tank. It's as simple as that. Positive procrastination, another one. Fascinating study came up to this result. I don't want to eat ice cream. So I say to myself at 6 o'clock right after dinner, I'll have it later. I'll have it after the 9 o'clock news. You know what that does? Do you remember the, big, the, the, the reward spike in the brain? Telling yourself you'll get the reward later makes that spike happen. So you trick your brain into believing you've already eaten the ice cream. And you're much less likely to eat the ice cream. Trick your brain by putting it off. Fascinating stuff. The nothing alternative. This one's particularly popular among writers, people who have projects to do that involve being solitary and sitting at your desk. So you say to yourself, I will commit three hours, these three hours, 9 to 12 tomorrow, to this task. Give yourself one instruction. Do this and do only this. So if it's writing a report, work on the report or nothing. Force yourself to do nothing or write the report. The rest will take care of itself. Because if you hold yourself to doing nothing, eventually you'll write the report. It's very simple. It will happen. Keep track. We talked about Weight Watchers and monitoring and the effect of the, the power of monitoring. Keep track of stuff. Just the act of keeping track will matter. And then the last tip, reward yourself often. Who here has, uh, has heard the, the notion that all teenagers have ADD, right? Every 14-year-old boy in the world has so much energy they can't sit still. Ever watch a 14-year-old boy play a computer game for six hours? <laughs> and what's going on? Rewards. Flashing lights, noises, pretty pictures. You moved up the level, you're now a 93rd caliber warlord. Right, or whatever. Or what's your name? Lara Tomb Raider comes out and promises things. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just imagining what it would have been like when I was a 14-year-old boy. That would have kept me going. <laughs> Reward yourselves. Making change is hard. Rewards keep you going. We're very closely coming to the end of our available time. Questions. Questions to have. Tim. How do you break the tobacco habit? That's a tough one because in addition to the, the mental side of the habit, you do get chemically induced cravings. Mm -hmm. There's a, a very, very powerful book that, whose title escapes me right now. It goes into descriptions of, of smoking cessation programs that have worked. But the characteristics that seem to work are you have to be ready, you have to be convinced that it will work, uh, you need to be working in a group, you need to do 
this, you need to clear it up, like say, there are five or six characteristics. I wish I could recall the name of the book right off the head, but I can't. But I can find it, and anybody who's really interested, a quick email, and I'd be happy to get it for you. Other questions? Charles. Stan. Charles, stand up. I'm sorry? What makes that it? I'm sorry. <laughs> what makes habits hard to change? Okay, what makes habits hard to change is the craving. Because as soon as you get that cue, you get hit with the craving. And the craving <coughs> simply amplifies the desire. But then at the same time, if you are depleted, that craving will feel even stronger. That's what makes it habits so hard to change. Yes? I'm not sure, but can I buy the glucose? And let me explain why. This group, one day fast, 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 one day fast. Some of my best work is when I did the 21 day fast. I'm water. I would run six miles a day. I was inspired in some of my best thinking. Is even when I do a one day fast. Well, I come up with some of the most creative stuff when I'm, I get out of fast. So, how would you explain it? You are, you restore your glucose to sleep in addition to your diet. So, maybe that would so it's entirely possible that you still have a relatively normal amount of glucose after 21 days. Yes, with sleep. It's possible. I, I don't, I don't. Quote me that that's the only and best answer that's possible. Over here. Even then here. How do you um, attack the emotional attachment to cravings? How do you I'm sorry? Overcome, how do you overcome the emotional attachment to cravings? Like, ah. It's due to emotions and whatnot. How do you actually overcome that main source? I, honestly, I'm not sure that that's a separate question. Because I think we all attach some emotion to that jelly donut at 3 in the afternoon. One over here. And over here. Okay. Well, um, the second one's going to cost you a dollar. Um, how can you apply the perspective for enthusiastic? Too much, sorry, too much. Enthusiastic is for religious uh, I, To be honest, I think Oscar Wilde said it best when he said, I can overcome, I can. I can resist anything except temptation. Uh. Uh, I've just realized that I talked so long we did not get to how to apply this to Toastmasters. So I guess that's your moment. <laughs> yeah. You said you had a second question. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't me. Okay. Any other questions before we have to abandon the room and let somebody else in? Did you ever do the talk and you know what is the next one that you go up to the room and the next one? This is the first time we've ever given this talk. Okay. <laughs> so I'll be interested in what your desks look like next week. Yes. I'm sorry? Have I had success? I'm working on the ice cream habit right now. <laughs> All right, we got to wrap it up. I guess we do need to wrap.
and you get home and your wife says, we need to talk about how we're going to pay for vacation, ask her to put it off until after. Okay, we got one more time for John Lobby. And we got a Which, in which I will be talking about these kinds of things and perhaps even monitoring my ice cream. <laughs>